Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second Family Education Night of the 2024-2025 school year. This is one session in a series of six. My name is Kristen Parson, and I'm the IEP-IAP liaison for North Stars Career Center. I'd also like to introduce Holly Peel, who is the director of the Career Center. At the Career Center, we work with juniors, seniors, and young adults with disabilities to help them build career readiness skills they can use as they transition out of secondary education and enter the workforce. You can learn more about the different programs that we offer uh, programming in on the Career Center tab of North Star's main website, or you can reach out to us directly via email. And we'll be sure to post our contact information in the chat shortly. We're also very happy to have Sarah Thompson from the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services with us tonight. Sarah has over 16 years of experience working with children and adults in the areas of mental health and developmental disabilities. Prior to joining them as the supported decision-making community resource consultant lead in the Commonwealth of Virginia, Sarah worked for the Developmental Services Division of a local community services board as a support coordinator, intake coordinator, and quality specialist. Sarah works to lessen the stigma around needing support and will be speaking about supported decision-making and supported decision-making agreements this evening. This session was a new addition to our series last school year, and we're excited to share that we've since had families coming to us already knowing what a supported decision-making agreement is. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah and the rest of us are gonna turn off our cameras Please remember that you are welcome to chat any questions that you may have during the presentation, and there will also be an opportunity to ask questions after we've stopped recording. Thank you so much, Kristen and Holly. Thank you guys for having me here uh, for a second year. I was really looking forward to tonight, um, and Holly made my week really last week by giving me some updates about things that you guys have done at North Star and things that families have said to her about supported decision making. So I'm thrilled to be back for a second year. My job at the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services is really to go around the state and share information about supported decision making and supported decision making agreements with anyone and everyone. So um, I'm thrilled to be here tonight sharing this information with you all. Tonight, we're going to cover um, some definitions about different decision-making options. We're going to look at supported decision-making and how it's related to self-determination, informed decisions, and then I'll also give you a little brief history of supported decision-making, just so you have a better understanding of how we kind of got to where we are today. Uh, we will look at what supported decision-making agreements are the benefits and risks of them, and then we'll go through some of the documents that we created to help you all with creating your supported decision-making agreements if you're interested in doing so. I have a few key questions that I'll answer at the end, and then we'll open it up uh, to you all. So to get things started, I like for us to kind of think. Uh, think about yourself. So I'm going to give you some examples of things, and I want you to think, are any of these helpful to you when you have to make a decision? So things like getting medical terminology explained in plain language. Maybe having reminders for important dates or appointments, whether this is somebody reminding you, another person, or technology, your phone, computers, uh, calendars, those kinds of things sending reminders, or a combination of all of that. How about getting advice from friends or family members? Maybe doing some online research to understand what the heck the mechanic is talking about when they tell you that you need some kind of car repair. Taking some extra time to think through complex choices versus making a decision right away. Maybe getting a second opinion before having a medical procedure. And finally, what about making a pros and cons list before making a big decision? Either doing that on your own or with other people that might help you think through the pros and cons of your options. So the one thing that all of these have in common is that these are all forms of supported decision-making. 
and people with disabilities have not always been afforded the opportunity to practice supported decision making and tend to go straight into things like substitute decision making when they become adults where other people make decisions for them instead of them being able to make decisions for themselves. So now I want you to think about, have you ever made a decision that did not turn out well? So thinking to that decision, are there things that you would do differently now? And are there things that you learned from that decision and that outcome? So what if because you made that one decision that had an outcome that you did not like or unintended, you could no longer vote, no longer drive, no longer decide if you want to be in a romantic relationship with somebody. These are all rights that people lose when they enter into things like legal guardianships. So some of the basic ones in Virginia are the right to vote, the right to drive, the right to work, to have uh, personal relationships with other people, making decisions about their daily lives, like where to live, owning a uh, gun or a firearm, and making decisions about things that they do during the day. So it's important that people understand this um, because things like legal guardianships are seen as quite restrictive because they take away these legal rights and they take away the person's ability to make decisions. So we need to know what's at stake before we start exploring or enter into, entering into these options like legal guardianships. Also supported decision-making now that we'll talk about tonight is a way for people to kind of get support with making decisions, um, but still keep these rights and their ability to make decisions. So let's look at a few definitions. First, decision-making is a problem-solving skill. It's the act or practice of making choices by identifying who the decision or what is the decision that needs to be made, getting information about all possible options, and assessing those risks and benefits of each option. This can kind of seem daunting or overwhelming at times, depending on the specific decision that needs to be made and our personal experience or knowledge leading up to this point. And this is where supported decision making can come into play. Everyone receives supports with making decisions, as we talked about a few slides ago. The American Bar Association defines supported decision making as a decision making and model in which an individual makes decision with the support of trusted individuals. So this means that people make choices with the help of people that they trust and that know them well. Supported decision-making is something that can be done at any age and as a way for people to develop and improve upon their decision-making skills. On the flip side, we have substitute decision-making. And this is a decision-making model in which a person or multiple people are appointed to make decisions on behalf of that individual, typically when that person has been deemed to be incapable of making decisions for themselves. And in those cases, the people that person typically loses some, if not all, of their legal rights and their decision-making ability. I have a couple graphics on the next two slides. Um, so on this slide, it looks at the decision-making options in Virginia and splits them between supported decision-making and substitute decision-making. So under supported decision-making, we consider these options to be least restrictive because people keep their decision-making ability and keep their legal rights. So options for this can be power of attorney, advanced medical directive, and supported decision-making agreements. Now on the substitute decision-making side, this is something where we consider these options to be more restrictive because they can take away people's rights, legal rights, as well as uh, limit or remove their ability to make decisions. So this could be things like full or limited conservators, full or limited legal guardians, and authorized representatives. Now, if we're talking about a DVHDS authorized representative, which some of you might be familiar with, those are people that um, don't necessarily take away legal rights, but it does, um, 
have the DBHD as authorized representative, they are able to provide consent to services um, and the release of information for that particular individual, but it doesn't remove any of their, that individual's legal rights. This is another graphic that just looks at the um, different decision-making options in Virginia, again, from least restrictive to most restrictive. So the least restrictive is supported decision-making agreements. And then we go to advanced directives and power of attorney, authorized representatives, then temporary or limited guardians, and all the way up to full guardianship being the most restrictive because it removes all legal rights. Um, on this graphic, there are also um, links to each of the Virginia state codes that relate to each of these types of decision-making supports. And you guys um, will have a copy of this PowerPoint where you'll be able to access that information. So next I have a quick video for you all about supported decision-making. Supported decision making is that you are making decisions, but you are so uh, actually getting help from other people. One of the most important things about being human is feeling that you have control over your life and that you understand and feel good about what decisions you're making. Decisions I would make on my own would be deciding what I want to eat and uh, also check my mail when I need to, check in with friends, my parents, and my siblings. We all use supported decision making. Every time you ask for advice from a friend, family member, you may ask advice from a professional when you're making a medical decision. Some decisions I need help with. Who do I ask that help me make decisions on my own? Would be my uh, peers, my parents, and friends in the community. I look for people that I trust and care about me. Some decisions I like to get help with would be definitely medical decisions. Sometimes you may not know what they are, and that there's always good people that I can help. My mom helps me make decisions on talking to my doctor. She helps explain what's going on. Making decisions to live on my own is important. I prepare for myself a walk. I have my clothes that I can lay out on my bed, and then I make that decision on my own to do that. I might make mistakes, but I want to pick myself up and keep going. My mistake would be drinking too much caffeine. I had to learn to cut back. I'm learning how to cook. So I get to find my own recipes. I find my own meals, or I actually have meals that are left over from dinners or lunch. It feels great that I can live on my own and have my freedom. Whether we have a disability or not, very well-intentioned supporters can sometimes make decisions about our life or try to really influence decisions about our life. It's your life. When I make a tough decision, it would be something that might be hard and a challenge, but I'm up to the challenge. But like I said, you have a group behind you. The reason why you have that support group is because they know what you want and they'll like to help support you. If you need help making decisions, go to your full support team and they will have your back. So that was Will from Tennessee telling us a little bit about supported decision-making and how he uses it in his life. One of the great things about supported decision-making and why it is so important is that it increases a person's sense of self-determination. And self-determination is when we are able to control our own lives. Studies have shown that people who have a higher degree of self-determination have better health outcomes, have more relationships with others in their communities, and even have better employment outcomes. Additionally, self-determination leads to a sense of responsibility and independence and prepares people for making riskier decisions down the road. Supported decision-making is also a way for people to advocate for themselves by making choices about what they want and don't want in their lives. You might be wondering, this is all great, but what does it actually look like to support someone? So when you are supporting someone with this idea of supported decision-making, you are taking the time 
to learn and understand how somebody best obtains information and learns because we all learn differently. You also know how that person communicates their thoughts and desires to others because again, we might not all use uh, words to communicate, but I can guarantee you that everyone communicates in some way. Once you know these things, you ensure that whatever tools or accommodations are needed for that person to learn and communicate are available. Then when the situation arises in which they need help or support with making a decision, you are clear about what you do and do not know about that topic. It is important that everyone has the opportunity to make a true informed decision. So when providing support through the supported decision-making process, you help that person think about and understand all possible choices and options. So not just those that you prefer as the supporter, but truly what are all of the possible options available to them. The benefits and risks involved with each option and thinking through kind of the long-term or short-term impacts. If it's a topic that you either don't know anything about or don't feel comfortable supporting, or for that matter, might be a conflict of interest, please, please be honest and open about this with that individual and try to find uh, somebody else who might be able to support them with that particular uh, topic or decision that needs to be made. So when someone's making an informed decision or an informed choice, the things that they're gonna need to know are First, what is that decision that needs to be made? And like I said, what then are all of the options available to them? And third, what can happen if they choose each of those options? Remember, you know, we might make a decision and it might have an immediate impact, but it might also have a long-term impact or it might impact other thing, other parts of our lives. If I make a decision about work, that might impact where I live, that might impact my insurance and my other benefits. So keeping in mind those kinds of things. And then finally, once you make a decision, what are the next steps? What do you need to do to actually see that decision through? So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of supported decision-making. The idea of supported decision-making really came about in the 1960s and 70s with this idea of deinstitutionalization or people were moving from hospitals and institutional settings back into their communities with help that was needed. This was happening in the United States. It was also happening um, throughout Europe. From there, we moved to um, the early 1990s and into the mid 2000s, when places like Canada, the United Kingdom and Sweden all had either legal cases talking about supported decision making or they actually created laws um, formally addressing and acknowledging supported decision-making. Then in 2006, the United Nations um, created a convention on the rights of, a, of persons with disabilities. And the goal of this agreement was to promote, protect, and ensure the full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by all persons with disabilities and to promote respect for their inherent dignity. So this was something that um, became active officially in 2008. Um, and it asked that countries um, agree to four main obligations or responsibilities, all which centered around or focused around supported decision making. So increasing the concept and uh, idea of supported decision making and removing or getting rid of things like substitute decision making or options that were restricting people's rights and decision making authority. There are currently 195 countries in the world and 193 of those are members of the United Nations. However, only 17 countries have done what they need to, to say that they um, fully agree with this and are implementing uh, this convention into their laws. In 2009, the United States said, yes, we agree with this convention, but it was not, they, we have not taken the steps to do what we need to, to say that we are going to actually follow through with what is written in the convention. 
So that takes us from 2009 then in the United States to 2012, where the first legal cases around supported decision making took place uh, in Virginia and New York with Jenny and Damaris. In both cases, they both involved guardianship for both Jenny and Damaris. And uh, through the course of those cases and through the course of the coming years, they utilized supported decision making to show that they did not need guardianship, that they were okay, they had support, and could make decisions with that support. So their rights were eventually restored, and they continued to utilize a supported decision making model um, from there on out. Following those two cases, the supported decision making and agenda for action report was made, and that helped with um, assisting the formation of the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making, which worked with states across the country to help uh, promote and advocate for supported decision making at a state level. Currently, we have just over half of the states, including Washington, D.C., that have some type of law recognizing or acknowledging supported decision making. And then that will take us over to Virginia. So Jenny, again, was actually the very first case uh, around supported decision making. Her case took from uh, 2012 through 2013. And following her case in 2014, the Office of the Secretary of Health and Human Resources requested a study be done about supported decision making. And in that study, they did find that supported decision making was a good thing and it was helpful uh, to people with a variety of disabilities and people in general. From there, we jump ahead five years to 2019, where the Office of Health and Human Resources again requested another study be done. And this time, unfortunately, that request failed. But the ARC of Northern Virginia that same year worked on a pilot project related to supported decision making, where they helped several individuals create agreements and work through this process. And they found in their uh, pilot study and report that, yes, supported decision making is a good thing. And the following year in 2020, uh, supported decision making was studied again <laughs> uh, through another work group. And uh, it was determined that again, this is a positive thing um, and can help and uh, greatly impact in a positive way the life of people with disabilities. And so in 2021, House Bill 2230 passed, which formally recognized supported decision-making agreements for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Virginia and directed DBHDS to um, work with stakeholders and to figure out what does this actually mean? What is this going to look like for Virginians as well as to provide education? So in early 2022, we held another work group full of um, stakeholders, so advocacy organizations, other state agencies, and self-advocates and family members of advocates who um, all work together to lay out what does this look like for Virginia and to create the documents that we will look at in just a little bit. Throughout that work group and um, throughout everything that we have done through DBHGS since then related to supported decision making, we've always kept in mind these four principles. These were created through one of the earlier work groups in Virginia, and so it's something that we felt was really important to continue to keep in mind to help guide us. So the first principle is that everyone should be presumed capable of making his or her own decisions. Not only is this a principle we kept in mind, but it's actually uh, a law in Virginia that says that every adult 18 and older is presumed to be able to make their own decisions, so presumed capable, and that a diagnosis alone should not be reason to question their ability to do so. The second principle looks at when somebody does need help with making decisions, the least restrictive option that meets their needs should be pursued and every effort should be made to maximize their autonomy and independence. So supported decision making is considered the least restrictive way for somebody to get support when they need assistance. The third principle looks at the fact that we understand that sometimes people do need more support. Um, some people might sometimes need a substitute decision maker. 
However, when that is the case and that occurs, we do ask that the substitute decision maker or agent, that person who is making decisions for somebody else, take into consideration what that individual or that person actually wants, what they have stated or indicated their wishes and desires are. And then finally, the fourth principle that we have um, kept in mind is this idea of dignity of risk. So making decisions takes practice. Like we said before, decision making is a lifelong skill. And it's something that we all develop and learn and grow with. So people, whether they have a disability or not, should be afforded that opportunity to practice making decisions, to grow from making decisions, and to grow from making decisions that maybe have unintended or negative outcomes. And that's this idea of dignity of risk. So making a decision that has a negative or poor outcome should not be motivation for restricting somebody's rights through things like guardianship or other forms of substitute decision making. Like we talked about earlier on, we've all made decisions that if we could go back and change, we likely would, but we learned from them, we grew, and we made different decisions going forward. And so everybody should be avail um, afforded that opportunity. Now let's look um, about supported decision-making agreements themselves. The supported decision-making agreement is the formal process of documenting who somebody wants to support them, what areas of life they want support in, and how they want to be supported. In Virginia, supported decision-making agreements are made up of at least two people, the person making the agreement, so the decision-maker, and at least one person helping them or one supporter. We also have this third option of a facilitator. So the decision maker, again, is the person making the supported decision making agreement. And in Virginia, they have to be at least 18 years old. They have to have an intellectual or developmental disability, and they have to be legally able to make their own decisions. So this means a court can't have said that they are legally incompetent. Now, your supporters can be anybody that the decision maker trusts and that then the supporter agrees to provide uh, support and help. So this can be maybe family members, friends, really anybody um, that's in the decision maker's life that they trust. It can also be that you have different supporters depending on the different type of um, support or decisions that need to be made or with a different type of support themselves. So you might have one supporter for making decisions about money, another supporter for making decisions about work, and then another supporter for making decisions about your health care needs. And then from there, you might also have a whole different supporter that helps you with communicating your choices to other people. So the types of things that supporters provide help with and the way they provide help are all documented in the supported decision-making agreement. We also then have this option of choosing a supported decision-making agreement facilitator. Again, it's not required, but it's something that we wanted to have as an option. And the facilitator um, is a person who is there to just kind of oversee the agreement and make sure that supporters are doing what they say they are going to do based off of what you've written in the document. Both the supporters and the facilitator are not paid, though, to help the decision maker. This is not tied to any type of funding. This is not tied to the waiver, um, the DD waiver or CCC plus waiver, anything like that. Uh, your supporters and the facilitator, if you have one, are really just agreeing to be natural supports or volunteer supports uh, with very specific tasks that are outlined within the agreement. Um, with that being said, it's also good to know that the supporters and the facilitator do not have the ability or the right to sign any forms for the decision maker or make any decisions for the decision maker. Because again, the decision maker is keeping their legal rights and also keeping their decision making authority or ability to make decisions for themselves in the end. So some of the benefits of supported decision-making agreements, um, like we talked about before, is that um, people have the ability to maintain all of their legal rights. 
And when this happens, people feel more empowered and willing to make decisions, which again increases that independence and self-determination. Studies have shown that things like guardianship don't actually increase safety, but self-determination does increase people's safety. Additionally, when people have the ability or the chance to explore and learn and develop new skills, this can help them live more independently and kind of live the life that they want, get them moving in the direction that they want to go. One of the other benefits of supported decision-making agreements is that they can be created for free. In addition to being created for free, they can be updated for free and canceled for free at any time. Whereas when you're creating other things like guardianships, that's an expensive and can be lengthy legal process. And if you need to update that guardianship order, it's just as expensive and lengthy of a time as it was to initially create that agreement. And now we also wanna talk about risks because I know that that is something that people get concerned about, especially when they're talking about supported decision-making. So we do know that nothing in life is free of risk or danger, but we did talk about the fact that uh, self-determination, a higher degree of self-determination does reduce things like a person's likelihood of being abused and exploited. And things like legal guardianships don't prevent that from happening. Um, then we also have things like natural barriers, whether it's barriers that society and laws have created our own individual values. Um, these are all things that can help kind of reduce risk in somebody's life. So thinking about, you know, maybe I'm concerned that my loved one might enter into a financial contract for say, ones that I've heard are common are leasing an apartment or leasing a car. Well, both of those are gonna require credit checks um, financial background checks, resources, like actual financial resources avail and assets available to your loved one in the moment. Um, so if those are things that most young people don't have available to them already, they don't have much of a credit history, they might not have uh, funds available to them that are required to secure those kinds of um, things like a, an apartment on their own or a car on their own. So these are all barriers that are already set up in most systems that can kind of help reduce the risk for people. Also supported decision-making, if you're providing that education um, on an ongoing basis and talking with people about their uh, resources, talking to people about types of decisions that they might need to make, then you know they're less likely to uh, enter into riskier decisions without support. We did at the state, um, this was part of the mandate that we had at DBHGS, we created a protocol for addressing abuse and exploitation. And this just lays out what we are asking supporters and facilitators to do. It also provides information to them if there are concerns related to abuse, exploitation, neglect, or undue influence to um, how to contact APS um, and file a report if needed. So just as it's important to understand what supported decision-making agreements are, it's important to know what they aren't. And they are not a backdoor or another way to get into guardianship. So just because maybe you as a parent does not agree or a caregiver does not agree with the choices um, that your loved one makes doesn't mean that they necessarily need a legal guardian or to have their rights taken away. It just means that, you know, they need some support and that's okay because we all receive support when it comes to making certain decisions and we've all made decisions that we might do over or do differently if we could. Uh, support decision making agreements are not a way for supporters to make decisions for the decision maker. Again, they are just there, the supporters are just there to ensure that the decision maker has what information they need to make an informed decision. Um, and they do not take the place of things like advanced medical directives and power of attorney. So you can have a supported decision-making agreement along with an advanced medical directive and power of attorney as they all do their own separate things. So it's important to think about that, especially in, say, um, emergency situations where 
someone's not able to make decisions, something happens and in the moment they can't make decisions. Uh, if it's psychiatric or medical, you've got an advanced medical directive that says what uh, your wishes are, or you might have that power of attorney that says what somebody's wishes are in the moment. So those are ways um, that in emergencies, people can provide support, whereas with the supported decision-making agreement in an emergency or situation where I can no longer make decisions for myself, the supported decision-making agreement doesn't give any of my supporters the ability to make decisions for me in those moments. So that's why it's important to consider all options and it's okay to kind of do a package deal. So the next thing we'll look at is the documents in that were created for Virginians to utilize. So we created a supported decision-making agreement template and several discovery tools to kind of help with this process of creating your agreement. The first discovery tool that we created is the when do I want support tool. And this is a check sheet that looks at common life areas and common decisions or tasks that most of us have to make in adulthood. Some might pertain to you and some might not, that's okay. We tried to think of as many decisions and tasks as we could. And what you do is you go through the sheets and you just kind of check off, is this a decision or a task that I can do on my own? Is this one that I can do with the help or support of somebody else? Or is this one that I need somebody else to do for me altogether because even with help, I can't do it. This is a tool that I've had teachers use for developing like independent living outcomes or goals and IEPs. It's something that I've had parents and children or, or young adults use and then they each fill them out on their own and then have conversations and it's brought up some really interesting and helpful conversations for people to see where they agree and maybe where we disagree and there are some things we need to work on together as a family. The nice thing about this discovery tool is that it goes in the same order of the uh, decisions and tasks on the supported decision-making agreement. So if you fill this out, it's really easy to then fill out a lot of the parts of the Virginia supported decision-making agreement template. The next discovery tool is the what kind of support do I want tool. And this is a way, um, another check sheet, for people to indicate what they find helpful to them and what is not helpful to them. Like I said, we all get help or like to be helped in different ways. So it has a common or a list of common ways people like to be helped. So things like having extra time to fill out forms, making a pros and cons list, getting help with documentation or talking to experts, having people come to meetings. It also provides blank space for people to write in other ways that they like to be helped and ways that are not helpful. Um, that's just as important for us to know if we're providing support to somebody so that we don't inadvertently do something that is really not helpful to them. And then finally, we have the relationship map. And this is just a visual discovery tool that helps you map out who's in your life and who might be people that you could ask to be supporters on your supported decision-making agreement. The supported decision-making agreement template looks at the life areas of health and personal care, friends and partners, money, where I live in community living, school and education, working, my rights and safety, meeting and talking with my supporters. And then we have this other area of other where you can really personalize it even more if we haven't addressed any of the things that you want support with in those other areas. Additionally, we have a place for people to indicate if they have other types of support. So say I have an advanced medical directive or I have a power of attorney or I have somebody that formally helps me with my finances. Then there's the section where the decision maker and the supporters all sign in the agreement section. And there's the cancellation of agreement. So say I created my supported decision making agreement and I don't want it anymore. I just sign a date and then it's void. Um, we have then a set space also if you have a facilitator for them to sign the agreement. We have the option to have the agreement notarized, although that is not required. Um, but if you would like for it to be notarized, it can be. 
And then we have space for people to um, update, document any changes and updates that they make to the agreement. And this is just the first page of the agreement. Um, it is 24 pages, and I know that seems like a lot, uh, but there might be sections that don't pertain to you or might be sections that you don't want any support. You can ignore those pages and go on to the next section. Um, most families that I support with this find at least one section that isn't one that they want any support in. And so it does kind of condense down the number of pages of their agreement. Over the past few years, we have created a handful of documents to help with this process in addition to the template and the discovery tools. So we've got uh, detailed instructions on how to fill out the agreement. We have a medical release form and an educational release form that are both in plain language. We have a tracking tool so you can keep track of who you've given a copy of the agreement to and what version. So maybe if you make an update, then you know who needs to get an updated version. We've got frequently asked questions documents. And then we have some more documents related to looking at, okay, once I know what I want help with, how I want to be helped and who might help me. Um, let me kind of narrow down and figure out who truly are the people that I should ask to be my supporters and then how do I ask them to support me? We have some templates that people can use as letters or um, emails or ways to maybe call and talk through it with their potential supporters. All of these documents can be found on the DBHDS website by going to this link or clicking on the, uh, taking a picture of the QR code. Um, the supported decision-making agreement template and the discovery tools are available as PDFs, uh, fillable PDFs, as well as Word documents. And they're in English and Spanish right now, but if another language is needed, that is something that we can do to get those forms translated. You just can reach out to me and let me know. Um, there's also recordings of all other trainings that I've done. There are a number of different PowerPoints and then other resources related to supported decision making that you can check out on that website. So now we just have a few common questions that I get. So a supported decision making or supported decision making agreement right for me. So I always say support decision-making is typically right for everybody <laughs> as it is. But in Virginia, it's important to remember that supported decision-making agreements, um, in order to have a supported decision-making agreement, you need to be at least 18 years old and have a diagnosis of an intellectual or developmental disability. Um, and you have to legally be able to make decisions for yourself. Um, so keep that in mind when it comes to the support decision making agreement piece. But most of us are already are using supported decision making as a practice or a concept. How do I create a supported decision making agreement? I always say to give yourself time. <laughs> supported decision making agreements do take some time to create because there's a lot of information to think about and something that you wanna take seriously. So having some conversations with people that you trust, it could be your family, it could be friends, your support coordinator. You definitely want anybody that you are thinking about as having a supporter to be part of that process because you need them to agree to what you are writing in your supported decision-making agreement. And if you need assistance or want assistance with this process, you are more than welcome to reach out to me. I am happy to help people through the discovery tools and through ultimately creating the agreement. Um, I do want people to know that in Virginia, supported decision-making agreements are not legally binding documents. So that means that someone can't sue a supporter for not fulfilling their agreed upon role um, or that they are not, uh, because they're not overseen by any specific entity um, or monitored by any specific entity. Um, so just be aware of that. Also supporters can't be, get in trouble for the decisions that the decision maker makes. However, the decision maker might have consequences based on their decisions like the rest, um, anybody else would, depending on the decision that they make. 
And do I have to use these forms or the Virginia Support Decision-Making Agreement template? And that answer is no. You can create your own supported decision-making agreement. We do ask though that if you do that, that you include at least these four elements. So who the decision maker or who you want as your supporters, when you want help, how that person is going to help you. So what does that help look like? And that you as the decision maker and all of your supporters sign and date the form as kind of a formal agreement to this document. Do I have to have a supported decision-making agreement? And that answer is no. You have the right to ask for help um, from anybody that you want to whenever you want to. You can even bring people to meetings without having a supported decision-making agreement. Additionally, if you have a supported decision-making agreement, you can ask for other help from other people outside of the supported decision-making agreement, and you can bring other people to your meetings that aren't listed on your supported decision-making agreement. This is just one way um, and one tool that can help people know more about what uh, support you want, how you want to receive that support, and who you want that support from. Sorry, I just went over all that information without changing the slide. <laughs> um, additionally, power of attorney and advanced medical directives are also another way for you to uh, provide information about how you want to be supported and what your wishes are. And when should we begin talking about support uh, decision-making options? And I say it is never too early to have these discussions. Again, decision-making is a lifelong skill. Um, so the earlier you start talking about these options, then the sooner you can start thinking about support that you might need or skills you might want to develop. I know that schools usually begin talking about transition around age 14, but sometimes they don't necessarily think about or talk about the decision-making options available, um, specifically those available to those in Virginia. Um, so it's important to have these conversations to know what your options are and to know um, or start taking the time to think about what might work best for you and your family. So finally, I will leave you with this. Children learn how to make good decisions by making decisions, not by following directions. So we will open up for questions and I will put my contact information up there. I know it'll be on copy of the PowerPoint that you all get to. Great, thank you so much, Sarah, for that um, presentation, the way you broke everything down was so clear and straightforward for something that actually feels very complicated most of the time. Yes. Um, so that's <laughs> always appreciated. And I really like that, how customizable the supported decision-making agreements are. Um, and that's just kind of the same thing for that whole spectrum of decision-making that you showed, right? That, that this is the first tier, the least restrictive, and then depending on needs, you can go to the more restrictive options. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I actually had a few questions for you, if that's oh, okay. Please. Of course. Um, <laughs> when, when, speaking of customizable, when you make the supported decision-making agreement, is it valid for only a certain period of time or is that something that can be put in there? Like I think about um, signing a release or sometimes HIPAA forms where it's like only valid for a year. Can they say up until the age of 25 or up until, is that something that can be integrated into there or? Yes, you could absolutely do that. Technically there is no limit on it. Okay. Um, we do encourage people to review it at least annually to see if there's any updates um, or things that need to be changed. Um, but you could certainly write in there that, you know, as written, it's valid until this date. And then it kind of forces you to revisit it. Um, right. Okay. That mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, especially because needs change. And mm -hmm. I know you also talked about how just because you have a supported decision-making agreement doesn't mean that you can't ask other people for help. And I think we all definitely do that just on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but if you do have someone designated as your supporter, can you also choose not to have them like come to a specific doctor's appointment, even if they're listed on the agreement? 
Absolutely. That's something. So when I provide trainings to like providers in the medical field or, or community service boards, anything like that, I always tell them when you get the support decision making agreement, see where it pertains to you mm-hmm. and see, you know, who might need to be part of that, those conversations. However, ultimately, you still need to get consent from the decision maker to have those people present or to be communicating um, with those supporters. So it still might be something that the decision maker says at this moment, this is a conversation or a meeting I want to have on my own and I don't want a supporter present. And that's totally fine. Great. Love that. Um, You talked about this training that you give to other people. And then you mentioned that people can also contact you. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like meeting with you for families as far as um, what they would need to be prepared to meet with you? Or is that like an hour long session or, you know, just materials that they might bring? Sure. So I'll be honest, it varies from family to family. Um, I really try to um, make it so that it, it's what works for that person. <laughs> um, but normally what I do is I will we'll talk on the phone usually first. I will send links to the discovery tools in the agreement just so people have time to look through them. Sometimes people like to fill out and, or start working on some of the forms on their own and that's fine. Sometimes they're just like, nope, we're gonna hold off until we meet with you. Um, if that's the case, usually what um, I do is it, timing wise, it, I find usually three to four meetings and those are about an hour long each that it takes just to get through each of the discovery tools. Then I take all that information and draft the agreement. Um, It isn't just the tools though. While we're meeting with the tools, I'm having a lot of conversations about each person's individual needs. What are things that have happened that um, are important to them that they want shared and known or how those things might impact their decision-making moving forward. And that information all really goes into personalizing the agreement for them. The final meeting, we go over that agreement um, and, you know, ensure I've had different things where some families have said, you know what, for right now, we know who the supporters are going to be. They're just not here. We'll review it with them. And I'm like, okay, gotcha. With your agreement, there have been times where we've gotten all of the supporters together and we've done that final meeting. It just depends on the people's personal preferences and probably who they pick and how yeah who, who the supporters they are, are and be. things like that mm-hmm. yeah that makes sense because supporters uh, don't have to be physically present it, it could be something where we you know zoom them in um and then they electronically sign the agreement okay cool um the last question i have is since we talked about how it's the spectrum and obviously the goal is to have individuals retain their rights and to have the least restrictive option but do you ever see this as families kind of navigate um, the transition into adulthood and individuals with disabilities start to take on more and more decisions and circumstances that this kind of can inform some of those other tiered supports? Like if maybe they start with a supported decision-making agreement and through that process, maybe it sheds light that they need additional supports, but at least they tried this first. Have you seen that a lot with families? So that's actually something that uh, Virginia now has in our code. So if people are going to pursue legal guardianship, um, the code says for uh, lawyers (laughs) that they have to explore least restrictive alternatives first. So exploring things like power of attorney and supported decision-making agreements and kind of saying that those don't work before pursuing something like legal guardianship. Um, and so there are certainly cases where that um, that is what happens. And, and I totally understand that. Um, but at least you've tried other alternatives sure. first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. I have questions too. And one's a follow-up question to that. So I'm going to jump in here. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for another wonderful presentation. You blow me away every time you (laughs) present and I always have new questions to ask you. And um, one of them is is to ask for guidance for some of our families. A lot of our families um, have folks in their lives who are 16, 17, 18, or maybe um, the person who's watching is that person who's approaching adulthood, right, with a capital A. And they're not quite sure they're ready to take on all of the legal liability that comes with adulthood. 
Um, and also, you know, maybe they're a family who's going to live um, as multi-generational adults for a while because that's the right fit for them. Like not everybody has to, you know, pack their bag and leave at 18. That's, that's really a fallacy. <laughs> Most humans don't live that way. Um, and so the family's looking for some tools or strategies to transition from having a child in their house to having an adult who's living. And it's almost like they need roommate tools, right? Like how, how can they have some structured resources to help them pivot from having a household with household expectations um, with the homeowner, certainly being able to set a bunch of those expectations, but then also having an adult with adult freedoms, privileges, and responsibilities living there. Um, and I can see some elements of this decision-making agreement that could actually really support that conversation. I was going to pick your brain to see if you have any other similar sorts of tools or resources for families who are evaluating their need for this or, or for that change um, that can help them have those conversations with their adult children. That's a great question. Um, Turning the Life course has a whole host of tools that families can utilize where um, it kind of, well, you lay out your resources, your skills, um, you look at things like this where <laughs> things that you do need help with and then your vision. Um, and what is it going to take to get to that vision? Um, I find that to be, they, their tools are very helpful in facilitating some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, so I would definitely check out, uh, I think that's like Kansas City um, Overseas Charting the Life course. Yeah, we can include the link. Okay. <laughs> um, if, if we if we can edit your um, PowerPoint, what we could do is say like further resources and put Charting the Life course there specifically. Is in there. And I know um, the Disability Law Center has some resources. They do. Those kinds of things. Um, let me see. And then we can have a, you know, a, a for further reading or further exploration slide that we could do as well. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know, how connected are you all with Pizzi? Sure. We can, we can plug in some of those too. Um, sometimes we can get lost in these long lists of resources. So I was hoping we could have a couple, but what we can do is go through those and um, for our viewers, you know, check out uh, Sarah's PowerPoint and maybe we can collaboratively edit a for further reading slide at the end of her presentation. Um, because I know when we're having these transition planning conversations, that's one of the things that comes up and to be very fair when uh, when I'm talking to, usually in this case, to parents and students are 14, 15, 16, 17, we're not sure yet what arc maturation is going to take. And of course, we want to support um, all of the real life learning that we possibly can. I wanted to ask one follow up question if Miss Parson is done. Did you ask their questions? You know, okay, good. Um, the yes, second one go. is Thank you, mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned the parameters for having a supported decision making agreement. And you mentioned one phrase very quickly. I want to make sure that I understood correctly. And that was that Virginia has to consider that you can legally make decisions. Would a different way of saying that, like, is you could be considered permanently responsible or um, maybe conversationally, we have other definitions. Like, can you, can you break that down for us exactly what that means? Sure. So it's, the term is legally competent. <laughs> um, so what that means is that a judge has not said that you can't make decisions. Um, so yeah, there's things like competency and capacity. There's a lot of words out there that technically mean different things, but people might use them interchangeably and it gets super confusing. Okay. For supported decision-making agreements, as long as a judge has not said you can't make decisions for yourself, you can do that. <laughs> you, can, okay. you can utilize supported decision-making agreements. Mm -hmm. But that's something that a person could also ask themselves and maybe their loved ones could ask, um, how might that go down? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's another kind of assessment tool to think about. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So typically judges would find, would say that you can't make decisions, um, if you are looking at legal guardianship or conservatorship in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've had a number of young people through the years who have been involved in the court system and have had that determination made. Um, so uh, my recommendation has always been that they reach out to Virginia Ability Law Center if they want to uh, review that decision now that they're- Oh, open. definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they right. even, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, they're, they are a great resource too. If you have done the guardianship route and you're kind of thinking, maybe I want to revisit that and I don't, Think that that's maybe the level of support we did need, 
they have a program where they can assist families with navigating that process to restore rights um, and remove the guardianship and, and put in place things like supported decision making. Right. Fantastic. Okay. And then you referenced a facilitator. I assume that's you. Um, so the, the decision making, support decision making facilitator isn't me. That's somebody else that kind of helps oversee the agreement. Um, in some states, though, what I do is considered a facilitator as far as helping families with creating those documents. I just don't oversee them once they're done. Um, I have had families that have done them and then said, hey, we've got some updates. Can you support us with, you know, redoing it to include those updates? And I'm always happy to do that, too. So who's the facilitator? Where do we find these facilitators? The facilitator can be anybody. Um, okay. So it's same thing like family members, friends. Um, I've had um, some families that have had one parent as a supporter and another parent as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. They've had other supporters as well, like family, other family members. Um, I've had some people that have had like a, a brother or sister or a, a cousin or uncle as that facilitator, um, just because the facilitator can also be there to be kind of their um, impartial, <laughs> uh, their neutral ground. Um, and sometimes that's needed in family discussions. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see it, especially when you were referring to like, there might be a supporter for education decisions, there might be a supporter for medical decisions, and then the facilitator could be kind of like the go between mm -hmm. of those different supporters. Yeah. That makes sense. And I do also have a training that um, it'll be, it's a, my last one for this year is in December where I go over all of the decision-making options um, just so people are aware of that whole spectrum, what is available and what does that mean. That's great. And we can find that at your website, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I can send you yeah. the link. <laughs> yeah, those are great tools. And also those are great um, plain language resources. Um, so that the decision maker can access this information um, and also bring family members in um, during that discussion. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. Again, I want to thank okay. everyone for joining us. And thank you, Sarah, for sharing your expertise thank with you us again. <laughs> and also for all of your incredible work uh, you're doing to support uh, independence and the dignity of people um, across the ability spectrum. So thank you so much for doing that. Yes. And I hope everyone is going to come back and join us next month when we talk about some of the other legal tools that are available. Um, and that will be with uh, Matt Bellinger, an attorney who focuses on disability supports and laws. Um, so I hope that you'll join us then. And um, please feel free to reach out to any of the three of us if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, we love nothing more than walking parents through this very important part of their journey. So thank you. Thank you.